always a privilege to share in God's Word with you. Well, there's plenty of good basketball uh, this weekend and more. I know everybody is looking forward. Of course, you're lucky. There's I don't think I've ever preached till 2 o'clock before, so uh, we're not going to have to worry about getting hung up on the ball game part. But uh, a lot of good basketball games, and uh, of course, we know UK and Auburn play this afternoon, and and if you've noticed some of these games, it was just one small detail that has cost a lot of these teams games because they were close this, these past three or four days. A, a technical foul here, or a missed defensive assignment there, and, and maybe a wrong call for uh, Carol and I disagreed. I, I thought Purdue should have fouled Virginia. Uh, there at the end of the half to put them on the line for two and since they had three points. She said I was wrong and, and proved that so because Virginia ended up winning. And uh, I think she's going to apply for the coaching job there at Virginia next year. <laughs> but uh, If she don't win, we'll. Small, <laughs> small details. And those small details can be very, very important. As we see, it costs some a trip home. And uh, they ended their tournament hopes. And we, if you look today in the games that will be played today, there'll be some small detail that will probably cost the team that loses today, whoever that is in the, in the two games, uh, that uh, someone will just have a, a little lapse of, of uh, judgment, somebody will do something they should have done or shouldn't have done and, or shouldn't do something that they did do. Uh, it's going to cost them a game. Well, as this is the last day of March. Man, man, March has shot by, hasn't it, this year? And Easter's ever closer. Uh, this sermon included, we got three more uh, until we'll be getting the Easter sermon. So it is really uh, moving along. And I want us to continue to focus on Easter and all that it means to us as Christians and the, and the events surrounding Easter because it's important for us to know because there's the vast majority of people running around that's not in a church on Sunday morning and this Sunday morning or any Sunday morning for that fact they may not understand the details about Easter well, they may know it has something to do with Jesus and, and on the cross because those things are visible you'll see some of those things but they don't know about the details. And that's what I want to look at this morning briefly in the title of the sermon being the prophecies of the Christ. Okay? It doesn't necessarily name Jesus, but the prophecies we're going to look at is about the coming Messiah, the, the Christ. And we're going to see that in these small details, just like the ball games that, that uh, we've watched over the past few days and few weeks. Uh, that the smallest details can be the most important details, and that's not uh, uh, safe to be true on this as well. Uh, but something else, as you turn in your Bibles this morning to John chapter 19, that's where we'll begin. I want us to think about this as well, as the cross as a place where God's love and man's sin kind of collide. They, just like two teams in a, in a tournament bracket you know, you see these teams continuing to progress, and they meet at the final at the final game, which is what the what the goal is for every team in the tournament is they want to meet that final opponent to take the championship. Well, in the same way, just imagine that God's love is coming down one side of the bracket, and man's sins coming down the other, and instead of the final game for the championship, it meets at the cross. Is where they meet. So that's what I want us to think about as we go over this. Uh, John chapter 19, verse 15 says this, and we're talking about the people, and this is a mindset. I, I, first, I want us to get an understanding of the mindset of the people around Jesus at that time. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief of priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Now, keeping in mind, the chief priest made this statement. So it's reasonable enough to say that the majority of the people, not all, because we know the work that Christ and the disciples did 
during his three years of ministry, there was people that had changed. But the majority of people probably shared in this sentiment that they were just going to do what the religious uh, high priest and the, and the temple priest told them to do. And, and if they said that Jesus was bad, then he's bad. If we have no king but Caesar, then we have no king but Caesar. And we can see that probably pretty plainly in Matthew 27, 25. And I'll flip over and read that. And listen to this. And when you think about this, it's really a, a sad statement. He, uh, again, this is right after the, we have no king but Caesar. Then answered all of the people and said, His blood be on us and on our children. We're talking about Christ, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Let his blood be on us and our children, the cursings of that. And, and they really didn't know what they were talking about because they were very accurate in that because the blood of Christ is what cleanses us from our sins, yes. But that's the state that people were in at that time calling for a horrible type of death. Uh, the only thing that obviously, and we know that Jesus was guilty of, is doing what God had sent him there to do in the first place. But how is it that man can get to the point where they can sink that low into sin and say, his blood be upon us and our children, being willing to carry that curse on to their children? And that just describes how low sin is will take you. Sin will, you will justify and uh, make things twisted around to serve your purposes to the point where you're calling for the death of an innocent man by the most vile, painful means possible. And saying so, and saying so confidently, I'll take on that responsibility and even let my children take on that responsibility. And that's where the mindset of the people were. We have no king but Caesar. In other words, Caesar was really their authority. That's who they were trying to please instead of being pleasing to God. And this son, quote unquote, he deserves to die a, a terrible death and let us be responsible if there is anything to be responsible for. They were willing to keep the ritual, you see, the ritual of, of religion, but they wanted to kill the reality of God's love, which was Jesus himself. And the sad part about that is today, we have people that would be right in that same crowd of people saying those same types of things. Sadly, in the world that we live in, because people have justified their sin and discounted God's word as being true to the point that they can make statements like that. And we hear those statements being made each and every day in some ways. Oh, a truly a loving God would not uh, condemn someone to hell. So you're discounting what God's word said and now you decided you have more knowledge than he does. It's the same thing that we're seeing here. They add, the attitude at that time was a rejection of Christ. Is it any different today? People reject Christ just the same today as they did then. So here we are with the rejection of Christ. Should I crucify your king? Remember, that's Pilate's statement to the people. We have no king but Caesar. That was pretty much the end of the trial. And it ended with the rejection of Jesus Christ. And that marks the end of his ministry as well. So a lot of things stop right there. And then this is kind of where they're at the final four. The teams are getting close now. They're getting into view. They know what's stacking up and who the potential opponents are. Sinful, vile, murdering man divine purpose from God and his plan for salvation and the cross again is that final game that championship game and the act of crucifixion just to remind you it's so bad the Romans would not allow any Roman citizen to be punished that way 
only foreigners, slaves or, or criminals, were allowed to be crucified uh, on the cross. Uh, but that's, and it's hard. I, I was, as I was going over and writing this sermon, thinking back, especially when I was doing PowerPoints, you would be amazed to how many times when a picture comes up for Easter, there's a Christmas picture somewhere. And you think about the, sh the stark differences in what we celebrated just a few short months ago with the birth of Christ and the innocence and just the, the feelings that we have that are, are, are brought up into our, with our surrounding our families. That little child, it's hard to reconcile that we celebrated in, in December, was born to die the most horrible death known to man. That's a hard thing to kind of wrap your, your mind around. But that's exactly the case. That's exactly what happened. Horrible death. But in this horrible death, Jesus shows and proves exactly that he is the promised Messiah. And we can prove that fact by looking at some small prophecies, his small details. And those small details are just as important, if not more important, than the big ones. Because uh, all the prophecies fulfilled, if not all of them, I should say, were fulfilled about Jesus, then he couldn't make a valid claim as who he was. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 18, if you remember this, he says, Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth shall pass, not one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till it all be fulfilled. And he's talking about the details. A jot and a tittle is just a small, small mark in, in writing out Hebrew. Okay? Just a little, just a little thing. Kind of like what we would consider... There will not be one I not dotted and one T not crossed. Okay? And just as insignificant as not dotting an I. But Jesus says even all the I's will be dotted. Maybe that makes it a little clearer for us. Jesus says all the I's will be dotted. So that means that everything that was foretold about the Messiah is going to happen with him. So we see that happening here. Uh, one thing I'd like for us to remember, John 19, 16, back to our original scripture. Right after we have no king but Caesar, then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. So here he was delivered, delivered to be crucified. Pilate acting or reacting more so out of fear, either fear that he'd cause an uprising by letting him go, or be uh, accused of not being loyal to Caesar by not uh, keeping him and punishing him, both of which would cause him great trouble. That's where you have to think about Pilate, and we can see that today, especially today, how that politicians, when some controversial issue comes up about their past or something they've said, what do they do? They scramble to make sure that it has the least amount of impact on their ability to be reelected next. Well, don't be fooled. We know they don't care about what they've done. They just want to make sure they can stay in office. So they don't want that to have, have an impact on them. Well, that's where Pilate is, too. He's saying, well, I've got to keep Caesar happy, but I've got to keep these people happy, so I've got to do what keeps me in office, keeps me from getting in trouble from Caesar. Trouble from Caesar is death uh, in some cases, and then revolt with the Jewish people. So there he is. He delivers Jesus up to be crucified. And how did Jesus react? He went willingly, didn't he? God delivered him up. For all of mankind. See, that's the point that, that Jesus, that's the thing that Jesus was sent here for, was to be delivered for our benefit. He was delivered, put into the hands of those that would, would do this. And then 1916 also says that he was led away. They led him away. Now, you think about sacrifices. Uh, these people would be no stranger to sacrifice, but I'll guarantee you that no animal that was sacrificed ever in that temple went willingly. 
In fact, if they had a knowledge of what was going on, I'll bet you they, they fought for everything that they could fight for to try to break free, just like we would. If we knew something terrible was going to happen to us and we had any hopes of being able to, to escape it, we would try to escape it, but not Jesus. He knew exactly what was coming up because he had talked about it. And he was led away. He went willingly because that was why he was there. But it was also foretold in Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed, and yet he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He brought, is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and the sheep before her shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. So he was led away, and he went willingly. Sheep have to be led. And Jesus, being the Lamb of God, just as a sheep, he was led away, as Isaiah had prophesied. Also, he bore his own wood. He carried his own cross. We know that, Rob. But how does that have anything to do with any kind of prophecy? Well, it's a foreshadowing, and we'll see that here shortly. Let's look at verse 17. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. So they laid the cross. I mean, we're familiar with this. Uh, from what we remember of movies because we, we don't really know what it looks like. Some carrying the whole cross, some I think like that one carrying the beam uh, of the cross. In either case, he's carrying his own wood up there, uh, part of the cross. He's going through the streets of Jerusalem to be crucified. Now here's something that we may not be aware of. The Romans did this for a couple of reasons. Number one, that someone, and this is about the Roman legal system, that someone might see this man Jesus and be able to stand up as a witness or whoever the convicted was, a witness for that person. Okay? That was one of the reasons uh, that he, that this procession. Uh, another one was kind of a deterrent to show that crime doesn't pay. Kind of like what we did here in this nation not too terribly long ago. And if you even look it up, it was probably uh, been once most recently than you think. But uh, public hangings, crime don't pay. You know, the Western, well, hang him at, at sunrise. And people gathered around and, and you knew that there was consequences to breaking the law. Well, the Romans did it for that reason too, both ways. Crime don't pay. Maybe there's some witness out there that can prove this man innocent. So, but nonetheless, he's carrying his own wood. And something else that you may not know about the Roman justice system. It provided two days between conviction and punishment, or capital punishment, of the uh, accused. And Jesus did not get that benefit. Jesus did not get the benefit of the two days. He was taken from jail. Uh, to judgment, to punishment, all in one day, just like Isaiah said it would. We'll look at Isaiah 53, 8. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? He was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was stricken. So even though the Romans had a system set up to where you had a convicted, a condemned man normally would go two days. That wasn't the case in this instance with Jesus because it would not have fulfilled the smallest of detail that Isaiah said that he went from, from one to other immediately, and that's what happened with Jesus here. So back to the wood. He had to carry it because the means of his own death, and that was foretold or really more so foreshadowed uh, in this instance, but yet it was an accurate thing. Genesis 22, 6 if you recall, Isaac, the son of Abraham, Genesis 22, 6, and Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they both went them together. So Isaac being a foreshadowing of Christ, as uh, Abraham, his father, was leading him up on the mount to be sacrificed. We know that story, right? And he raises the knife. You know, he has him laying there prepared 
raises the knife, angel says stop, and there's a ram over in the bushes. God provided his own sacrifice to him for that. Foreshadowing here of Christ bearing the wood, the instrument of his death, the instrument really of his sacrifice. Okay? Uh, so Jesus bore the, his own cross. Now, again, looking at 17. Uh, and he bearing his cross went forth into a place of the a place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. Now, when I was going through PowerPoint uh, videos or pictures, I've seen a lot of different pictures of Golgotha, you know, the place of the skull. And with modern technology where they can Photoshop all these things, you don't know what's real and what's not. But s most of those pictures that come up when you type in Golgotha, it kind of looks like a skull. The side of the mountain, you know, it's got a, a couple of deep inset places that would remind you of a, of a skull. So, and I guess that's probably what was the case there, why it was named that. But nonetheless, he went outside the city. The Romans had a law that no one could be executed inside the city of the walls. And if Jesus would have been executed by a Jewish type of execution, do we know what that would have been? He would have been stoned to death. And that would have taken place inside. But there is a reason that was foretold many, 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 many generations before that required Jesus to be executed outside the city walls. Okay? And uh, we actually went over this in uh, our Wednesday night Bible study this past week uh, as well. Uh, it's because all sin offerings according to the Levitical law and what God had put out in Exodus. All sin offerings must take place outside the city or at this place was the camp. Okay? Exodus 29, 14. But the flesh of the bullock and his skin and his dung shalt thou burn with fire without the camp. It is a sin offering. Leviticus 4, 12. Even the whole bullock shall he carry forth without the camp unto a clean place where the ashes are poured out and burn him on the wood with fire where the ashes are poured out as he shall be burnt. So any sin offering has to be done outside the camp. And Jesus is what? A sin offering. So he has to be, according to Levitical law, according to the law that God had laid down, outside of the city, outside of the camp, so as it were. And so he was. And then lastly, we're going to look at verse 18. And this is going to be one that you may or may not have ever thought about. He says, where they crucified him and two others with him on either side and Jesus in the midst. Well, that one picture, if you recall, Golgotha is, is the heights. You have to look up to it. And that's significant. Uh along with the, the fact that he was lifted up. Now, we know what crucified means. Nailed to a cross, lifted up on in the air. Uh, Calvary, skull, Golgotha, high place outside of town. Everyone could look up and see that silhouetted. Numbers 21, 8. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Jesus himself in John 3, 14 said this. Flipped over here. Referencing that very scripture I was talking about there. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So that's where that reference comes from about when Jesus said that, it comes from all the way back when, when Moses was instructed to put the serpent on top of the pole. The people that were bitten would look at it and they would be saved. In the same manner, we look upon the cross, the work at the cross for that salvation, put upon a high place. So details. Sometimes details that you just read over never understand but how important and how inclusive they are to the plan that God had. 
See, he used Romans and their law to fulfill his plan. He used the Jews and the law he had handed out to them, but more so their sin and the, the place that they were with their hearts and us too, really, to achieve his plan. So we see that, and it always amazes me that even the, how the small details, and I shouldn't be amazed, but it amazes me as I learn about these. Now that God has the smallest of details in the plan of in the plan for our salvation, then is it not reasonable to think that He has a plan of salvation? Sure. I mean, if He went to all all of this to make sure that the Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection fit into all the prophecy, everything that was mentioned about the Christ, then we have to be aware of that He is very detailed in what we have to do. Why? So that we can be saved. Okay? So when we hear preachers say, or you hear me say that you have to hear, you, we have to hear the Word of God. And you must believe the Word of God. And you have to repent of your sins or turn away from those. And you have to confess Jesus Christ as your Savior. And you must be buried with Him in baptism to receive the forgiveness of sin and the remission and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then you have to live faithful until death. Those are God's details, not my details. I mean, we didn't, <clears throat> the people that started this church back in 1830 or even before, they didn't just sit down and come up with those details. They didn't say, all right, here's what we think it needs to be done. They went through and they found those details in God's Word. Just the same way that God made the details about what the Christ would be, how you could identify and the things that would happen to that, the Christ, Jesus, in the same way. The details are important. The details are important with the story of Easter and the prophecy of the Christ. The details, as I said earlier, you, you, you mark it down. Somebody's going to miss a detail today that's going to cost somebody a game. Now, maybe these details about the Christ is not so terribly important today in our generation because there's no one trying to convince us as Jews that he's the promised Messiah. But most certainly the details about who Jesus is and the work on the cross and the salvation that he provides are important details to our generation because it is the only salvation that is offered to man. And we offer that this morning. If you've never accepted Christ today, let me encourage you to make today the day of your salvation. Maybe you have uh, heard some things that's inspired you to rededicate yourself. I encourage you to do that as well. In either case, we're going to sing softly and tenderly, uh, number 349. We're going to sing the first and the second verse. If you have a decision to make, we ask that you come as we stand and sing.